everyone. I'm Carrie Ann Flanagan Broski. And I'm Joe J. Quinto. And tonight we have a wonderful topic for you on Peter Underwood and the 10 types of ghosts. I'm a big fan of Peter Underwood and I'm very excited to give you this webinar tonight because sometimes it's nice to see other people's perspectives and he is an absolute expert in his field. I mean, he's, he's gone a couple of years now, but I am fortunate to be in touch with his grandson, Adam Underwood. That's and so we've been, cool. It is cool. I have to say it is cool. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Adam tonight as well, but we've been going back and forth and I actually contacted Adam, his grandson, a couple of weeks ago and said I wanted to do this webinar and he sent me some information and some great stories and uh, it's just really good. He's uh, Peter Underwood's work is what has inspired me uh, with my own work and Joe and I have applied a lot of these things. So before we get started with that, um, I just want to give a brief introduction. We have a lot of our same people every week. So thank you for your support in uh, joining us for these webinars, but we do have some new people as well. So I just want to state that I am the author of eight books and I'm working on my ninth book, which is called Haunted Long Island Mysteries. It will be out next fall. And my deadline is on Friday. So I did want to make mention because many of you have emailed me. And I love getting emails from you, by the way, uh, telling about your own stories or asking me questions. I have not responded, though, this week because I've been around the clock. Um, I'm a little bit over my word count, so I'm trying to lower that and doing my final edit before I pass it on to my publisher. So again, that book will be out next fall and I'm hoping that we will finally have in-person events again so I could see all of your smiling faces because all I see now is Joe. <laughs> it's and like, I know you're out that, there. And she's had that this yes, space for a long I, time. I, I so know you're out there, yeah. but my current books that I have, Haunted Long Island, uh, Historic Wants of Long Island, the Metal, which is my only novel mm -hmm. based on a true story about Padre Pio and uh, historic crimes of Long Island. And those are available, um, of course, in bookstores and on Amazon, but I am also selling them uh, through my website where you can get them personalized, signed and personalized with free shipping. I decided to keep the free shipping into 2021. So those are available uh, to you. So Joe, you want to say a little bit about yourself? Sure, sure. So I started out my career by moving into an old house, which was haunted, and the rest is history. No, <laughs> no. Um, and after that, I was interested in ghosts and things. And uh, I had a little paranormal group years ago in the 80s. And, and then I moved out to the West Coast, where I opened up my computer business. And then I was lucky enough to come back in 2005. Well, a little earlier than that, but then I happened to go to Carrie Ann's lecture. In yep, October and we've been working together we, ever since. Ever since. <laughs> I can't believe it's been 16 years. I know. It's it's, it's crazy. It really has. And we've um, investigated over 100 places mm -hmm. on Long Island that are presumably haunted. We lecture extensively together. And, um, you know, it's really been a journey for us to see how these yeah. ghost books have evolved and especially i can't wait to share this next one this next oh book with this you. is guys this is gonna it's, be awesome yeah, yeah. It's, and no, it's an interactive I, book i mean you'll be able to listen on your computer as you're reading the book you have so, no idea yeah so it's, it's, it's gonna I be can't, a lot of fun. i can't say anything but even oh it's just especially <laughs> the british guys that's gonna be <laughs> right so we have a lot of fun things but for now we're doing our webinars so um, now the first ghost book that I, I wrote, my earliest books are on Huntington's history, which uh, Huntington's Hidden Past and Huntington's Past Revisited. Those came out in 1995 and 1997. And there were a couple of ghost stories in there. There weren't ghost books though. And people encouraged me to you know, write a ghost book down the road. So when I wrote Ghosts of Long Island, Stories of the Paranormal, back in 2000, I think, I think it came out 2006, because I met Joe in 2005. When that came out, um, I had an interest, I was doing a lot of research about the paranormal, because I was new to the field at that point. Joe has taught me a lot. But I was doing a lot of research from uh, different authors and different ghost investigators. And one of them was the British ghost investigator and author Peter Underwood. And I especially was interested in his 10 types of ghosts, which is in, um, I have a copy of his book here. 
which one was it in? This was the uh, first book that I read by him. Ghosts and how to see them. Oh my God! And, I remember uh, that book. Yeah, and then when I, I was going book too. when I was going through it, it was interesting because I saw I had marked it with a uh, highlighter. You know, that's how I learned about that. There, ghosts couldn't be defined as any one thing. I know I've touched upon this during many of the lectures because it is a guide that we tend to use mm -hmm. um, during our investigations, yeah. but. Um, it was really, really interesting for me to be able to see those different types of ghosts and see how it pertained to our, uh, you know, lectures, right, Joe? I mean, you would say the same thing. That's right. right. Yeah. I mean, um, we've incorporated the 10 types of ghosts into our investigation work. Um, for example, um, I think, Carrie, when we go out to places, we look for specific types of phenomena and we, and we try to categorize them. Yes. It helps us make sense of them. For example, if we see, um, if we're in a historic home, we, and we're going to get into the specifics. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Peter Underwood first, but then we'll go into specifics of each type of uh, ghost there is. And we're going to share some stories. And I have a couple of things I added, Carrie Ann. Oh, I'm sure. Um, he keeps me on my toes. <laughs> I do. But, um, you know, we do incorporate uh, his work into our investigation. It helps us be a little bit more uh, credible, a little more scientific, and also helps us to understand what's going on. So, for example, if we see uh, an apparition and we're in a historical location, then we, we question whether it's a historic ghost. Or, so we'll get more in, into that later. Okay, we have someone saying in the chat room that they like your plant, Joe. <laughs> and we will take questions towards the end. Um, all right, I just want to make sure that it's everyone's in some terms. It's my remnant of my okay. Christmas tree in my room there. I, I, I'm a jack of all trades. Sometimes I have to double check my phone to make sure that no one is having trouble getting in. Oh, I did want to make one announcement. Uh, many of you have asked me about seeing the webinars at a later date, the past mm -hmm. webinars. Uh, some of you had had to work at last minute or couldn't get on for whatever reason. So I do want to let you know that that is my goal. Um, I've been crazy between the death of my mother in December and dealing with this book deadline. So I'm a little behind in things, but my goal is to work with my webmaster to create a YouTube page and we will have all of the past webinars. So you'll get to view them again. They won't be live, obviously. But if you missed any, you can go back and uh, refer to that. So right now I want to tell you a little bit um, about, I don't even remember how I got, or maybe Adam Underwood got in touch with me. I can't remember, but I've been in contact with him for a couple of years now. And um, we follow each other on social media. We've emailed one another. And he's been working all of these years and trying to keep his grandfather's uh, legacy alive. So I would like to tell you about that. So first of all, well, Adam has sent me this book. This is great. Um, this is an older paperback, Peter Underwood Haunted London. And I had asked Adam to sign it for me, which he did. I don't know if you could see that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So he wrote, Dear Carrie Ann, as per your suggestion, I hereby sign this copy for you on behalf of my grandfather, Adam Underwood. And then he writes, P.S., Hope this book doesn't uh, scare you away from making the trip across the pond. So I thought that that was really cute. I would love to meet up with him if I ever do get to England again one day. So for now, let's talk about Peter and then we'll go back to Adam. Um, Peter Underwood was a world renowned ghost investigator, author, broadcaster, and parapsychologist from England. He was also the president and chief investigator of the legendary British Ghost Club. And I think we have a, a logo of the Ghost Club, right? Adam had sent me a bunch of pictures of Peter and of uh, different things. So we do. We'll and I'll have that, that up. I'll have that okay. slide for you. In a okay. Um, so he was, he was the president and the chief investigator for over 30 years of this Ghost Club. And it's still prestigious. It's still out there. He devoted his life to the investigation of paranormal phenomenon. So here's the Ghost Club logo. That's cool. Right, isn't that cool? Looks like every Halloween logo you ever <laughs> see, right? <laughs> exactly, I love it. Um, but the, I mean, this organization has been around for a long time. Um, but Peter uh, devoted his life to the investigation of paranormal phenomenon. He wrote close to 50 books. Could you even imagine on the subject That's matter? Incredible. 
That's uh, he was born in 1923 and he died in 2014 at uh, the age of 91 years old. He was dubbed the Sherlock Holmes of uh, Psycheal, I can never pronounce this word, Joe. Psycheal, Psycheal Research by Dame Jean Conan Doyle. Okay. Psychic, psychical. Psychical, thank you. Peter devoted his life to the investigation of the unknown and was regarded as, and this is in quotes, as Britain's number one ghost hunter. So this is a great picture. When it I told great, Adam yeah. I wanted to picture, like this was the one, yeah, this is the picture that I wanted of him. He was very photographable. So that's, and, uh, yeah, go ahead, and, Joe. Um, he was a prolific author, you know, on all things paranormal. Uh, he did numerous radio television broadcasts, uh, lecturing extensively on psychic matters, not only in Britain, but abroad. And he was widely respected in the field for maintaining uh, the middle ground, skepticism, and an uncritical uh, belief. So he kind of balanced out, you yes. know, there's, there's a line that where you have to be open, but you also have to have your feet on the ground. Yes, and, and he definitely did that. He always ruled things out. Um, before he, he wrote about it. But his most well-known work uh, may be his first book, which is the um, Gazetteer of British Ghosts, okay, which I'll show here. This, and I think we have a, a cover of it, right? I think we uh, do. I sent yes. you a slide, but this is another great, the, oh, there we have is. a bunch of things to show you here. All right, this is his, uh, you know, an illustrated guide to, as you see, 236 haunted sites. And, and England, I mean, you know, we're the new country here in the United yeah. States. I mean, England is like, okay, well, <laughs> let's go to this, the castle from the 1600s. Um, but this was his most well-known book, which was the first one. It was published in 1971. It was the result of a quarter of a century of study and on the spot investigating. Mm -hmm. It was the first comprehensive guide to the ghost population of the British Isles. Another popular title um, is Nights in Haunted Houses, which is a series of accounts of night vigils in haunted houses that Peter actually did. It is a more in-depth tour of some of the most haunted houses in Great Britain. And I had purchased another one recently. Uh, for those of you, you asked me, you wanna learn more about this. I would suggest, I love this. I don't know who did this, um, but really Adam great. sent this picture and it's just a great, it's a great know, picture. Caricature. Yeah. And it just um, shows, it shows kind of, you can almost feel his, his nature yeah. that comes through in the investigating. Yeah, I mean, he exactly. would be, it'd be so much fun to be on, on a, tr on a investigation. Oh, I know it really would be when I tell you how he got started in that in a moment, it's just fascinating. Yeah. But a lot of people write to me and say, you know, I, I want to learn more about this stuff. What's a good book? So I want to show this one here. Okay. I don't know. Is it, is it backwards when you see it? No, I it's guess good. It is. Oh, I is see it? it good. Yeah, okay. that's right. And so it's the Dictionary of the Supernatural by Peter Underwood. And it's an actual dictionary where you can look up different um, paranormal terms and he gives explanations uh, to things. Everything's in alphabetical order, yeah. metaphysics, um, he has the mystery of Edwin Drood in here, uh, all, all kinds of things, you know, things having to do with palm, you know, you're reading your palms and things. So that's another uh, good book there. Yeah, no, I would. Um, you want to talk about uh, the Ghost Club for I, a yeah, minute? Because to, that, yes. that's a fascinating thing, Joe. I'd like to talk about that. Um, the Ghost Club, you know, it's the oldest organization in the world and it's associated with psychical research. Um, it was founded in 1862, but it has its roots in uh, Cambridge University, where in 1855, fellows at uh, Trinity College um, began to discuss ghosts and psychic phenomena. Because so you could just imagine, look, I mean, look at the members here, past members. Yeah, of this is great. You got to hear Charles, this. Charles Dickens, Siegfried Sassoon, Harry Price, which I was going to bring up before. So he's the guy, he's the one who invented modern ghost of SC. So when everybody goes out, and they do their recording, they make their, they write down journal their evidence and, and all that. Harry Price started that. He was the Oh, first I didn't realize ghost. that. Well, okay. yeah, I mean, I have, you could fact check on, this is general knowledge I know, but I'm going to look, maybe we'll do a thing on Harry Price mm. one day on his life because he really is very interesting. But anyway, there was also Daniel C Campbell, Peter Cushing, Peter Underwood, Maurice Grosset of Gross, 
and Sir Shane Leslie and Eric Maple. Is that Peter Cushing? Is that the same guy that Doctor Who and all that? I have no idea. <laughs> is that, I don't know. Is that, he was old. I mean, he always looked. Right. Uh, today, the Ghost Club is a nonprofit social club run by elected council of volunteers. Its purpose remains to its roots. The Ghost Club offers open-minded individuals, curious individuals, the opportunity to debate, explore, and investigate unexplained phenomena with like-minded yeah. people and record the results for posterity. How about that? There you go, which he has in 50 books. Oh, by the sure. way, I wanted to ask you, how, how did Peter Underwood get interested in ghosts? Do you know? This is such a great story. You know, growing up in England, his grandparents were farmers and they owned a house called Rose Hall Farm. And it was in Hertfordshire, England. And I believe that the house itself dated back to the 17th century. And as I said, Peter's grandparents were farmers and Rose Hall Farm was their home. Now there was an upstairs room that had always been rumored to be haunted. And back you know, in these days, we're talking, I think, around 1931, Peter was around nine or 10 years old. Um, this is the countryside, travelers would come through, and it was customary for people who were passing through, if they didn't have a place to stay, they'd knock, you know, on someone's door at night and, and say, do you have a room for me? And people would let them in. So it wasn't an inn per se, but mm -hmm. if travelers came through, um, they would knock and, and come in because this was really, you know, in the countryside. So this house in particular was written about, let me just see here, in a book called, um, it was presumably haunted. It was known as a haunted house. It was in a book called The Night Side of Nature from 1848. There was suggestions about there being a haunting there. Then it was written again in another two books in 1897. Now, Peter's grandparents had never experienced anything themselves, um, but the story lived on that there was a room on the second floor that was indeed haunted. So one night, a stranger came up uh, down, the, you know, down the road, and his grandparents um, let this person, this man, in. And Peter would often spend his entire summers at Rose Hall Farm. And he was very close to his grandparents and he would be there. But as he got older, they said, well, you know, we're going to give you a job. If someone comes and knocks on the door, then you're going to be the one to show them to the guest room. So Peter was all excited to have this as his job. But people would often say, you know, I want the upstairs room because I heard it's haunted. Mm -hmm. Again, it was in uh, these books. So how the story goes, this one evening, this man, it was a storm and this man came down the driveway and as usual, Peter's grandparents said, Peter, can you please, you know, bring this gentleman to the second floor bedroom? And he did. And oftentimes he would tell the story about the ghost story. But Peter at that time never believed in it. And he thought it was odd that adults believed in ghosts. So he mm -hmm. actually from early on, he didn't believe. Interesting. So this man goes to bed and in the middle of the night, he's woken. Uh, they must have had some dogs and the dogs were barking. And he woke up and there was this big, he was sleeping in a canopy bed. And he saw the image of a man, a well-dressed man in a blue coat with gold buttons standing at the base of his bed. At the same time, he also felt pressure being pushed on his feet. And he tried to see the man's face, but he couldn't even see a head. And at the time he thought, he couldn't see the head because it was blocked by the four posts, you know, one of the posts of the four poster bed. It was canopy. <clears throat> so he he was just shocked at seeing this vision. And he was he at first he thought maybe it was the innkeeper coming to check on him. But then the image, the person just disappeared. He immediately got out of his bed. And he went to the door of his room and found that it was still locked the way he had locked it when he came into the room. So there is no way that anyone could have possibly gotten into the house. So the next day during breakfast, he had told Peter's grandparents about this. And they said, we're not surprised. Many people have reported these things. So as the story goes, the original ghost story from this, from the 1800s, um, and this is in quotes, that a man had been murdered under in quote, frightful circumstances. Basically his head had been cut off. Mm, um, nasty. 
so those who have seen this ghostly figure, they never do see a head. We don't know who the man is or um, why he was beheaded, but that's the way the story goes. Um, again, at the time, Peter thought it was odd that, uh, you know, adults believed in ghosts, but obviously later on he decided to pursue it. That's very interesting. You know, um, my sister had a experience, which is very similar, but I'll really? bring that up later because it's, it's, I don't know it's connected, but we'll see. But anyway, that's really, that's common. You know, um, one thing I find with these stories, and I can understand Peter's um, skepticism, especially at that age. Sometimes when you're younger, you, you think you're immortal and, you know, you kind of dismiss stuff that seems kind of, ooh, you know. Yeah. But um, as people get older and they have their own personal experiences with things like ghosts, spiritual encounters, uh, they begin to believe. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, mm -hmm. the owner of the James Port Manor when he yes. said, you know, if I, if I, I don't believe in any of this, but if lightning strikes or something, and all of a sudden it did <laughs> right in front of his, his window there right. in, in front of the restaurant and then he believed. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh, but anyway, um, I'm interested in hearing more about um, uh, Peter's grandson, Adam. Yeah, he, he's an interesting guy. Um, he's created a very artistic, informative, and interesting website that you guys, I encourage you to take a look at this. It's www.peterunderwood.org. And it's great. I mean, it's so artistic. There's I gotta check it out. moving images and pictures moving, and it has quotes from Peter, and it's very easy to follow. He has a lot of these stories. Um, it's so interesting. So, uh in a recent email from Adam just last week, I wanted to share with you what he actually wrote for me, wrote to me. He said, I think I have simply responded to his self-evident wish for his legacy to continue. It pained me to realize how much of his body of work had fallen away out of sight. So I tried to think of a way to celebrate his life and work and communicate that to a new generation. The heart of the Peter Underwood website is an attempt at narrating his life and work, mostly using quotations from his memoir. So it became a scrolling visual and textual chronicle of events from beginning to end. And this went from 1923 to two, all the way up to 2014 when Peter died. So that's a direct quote from an email I just received from Adam you know, you know, it's a week ago. Yeah, you know, it's interesting about the way he writes. I mean, he's a good, he's obviously um, a, a good writer and he really visualizes the life of his father. It's his grandfather. Grand, I'm his sorry, grandfather, grandfather yeah. yeah. He um, also I said- I kind of feel like he's still alive. He's still yeah, a young no. guy, but anyway. Um, but he um, also said that after working hard, I, I forgot there was a, a continuation of this, after working mm -hmm. hard to revise and improve the titles, he's had many of these books republished so you can get them on Amazon. Uh, he said, I have been prompted by fans of Peter to go further, so I'm currently working on even more out-of-print titles. I also organize prizes in collaboration with others on social media to give away copies of his work and raise awareness. So uh, it really is very cool. Yeah, by the way, is there, <clears throat> is his father, um, is there anything about his father? His, his he, father is still alive. Um, I don't know if it? he's involved. Mm -hmm. I think he is, I, I think one of his books uh, there was a foreword or a preface by him. Okay. So, he's not, um, so I think he's involved, but Adam has really the grandson, taken really, yeah. the grandson is really, and I have to say a little tidbit on my new book that's coming up. Uh, I completed the preface a week ago and I started off the preface with a quote from Peter Underwood. Don't give away so, any secrets. I know that's the only thing I'm going to give away. But you I'm know, Carrie, away. and you always yell at me. <laughs> oh, what you they guys usually don't. usually do give things away. <laughs> I know. You, you, guys, what you guys don't know yet about the new book. Right. Um, I think it'd be a good time now. You know, I'm sure our audience is raring to go to, to get into some of these yes. things about the 10 types of ghosts and how we apply this to our work. So um, why don't you begin and go okay, through Okay, I agree, Joe. I'll start off with the first one. Mm -hmm. The first one's very easy, and it's the one that you probably would understand the most. It's uh, historical ghosts. These are ghostly figures that supposedly haunt old houses, mansions, and different places. Um, especially those that have a strong historical background. So obviously a lot of what Joe and I do for our work is based on history, 
preserving history. So we come across a lot of these historical ghosts. Now, usually they are dressed in period clothing. They never speak and they rarely show any signs of being aware of the presence of human beings. In many cases, the ghosts have suffered in some way during their earthly life, or they just may have an attachment to the place. Uh, did I lose you here? No, I'm here. Okay. Did you try to put something up? Because I, I lost my screen. Uh, oh, you did? No, I, yeah. I see you. Okay, there um, we go. Yeah. Um, so with these, with these types of historical ghosts, they become place centered, mm -hmm. which means they are confined to old properties or the places that, to which they lived. Now apparitions of historical ghosts may go on for centuries. An example from our work, and I know that we've mentioned this before, is Annette Williamson who haunts the country house restaurant. She is the, you know, Right. Well, although she's been able to communicate a little bit more. Yes, so yes. she borders oh, wait, Karen, that you, spirit that? ghost thing. Yes, I can see that okay, now. Great. Thank okay. you, Joe. So, but she is someone from history. She was murdered during the Revolutionary War and she makes her presence known. Uh, we did do a webinar specifically on Country House. So I don't want to spend too much time on this, but that is uh, really a good example of um, a historical ghost. Now, the second one is atmospheric ghosts, photograph ghosts, which are also called mental image ghosts. And events can imprint themselves on or in the atmosphere of the place or area where events have occurred. So Underwood describes it, uh, and this is a quote from him, like a cinema film appearing to anyone who happens to be in the right place at the right time. These ghosts are only visible for a, from a certain viewpoint and they're always doing the same thing. They are actually photographic recordings of past events. Oftentimes they are accompanied by sound. Now, Joe and I had this happen when we were on investigation in Strong's Neck that we had cannon fire. Luckily, Joe had his recorder going, but we experienced the sound of cannon fire while we were roaming the property in Strong's Neck and it was under certain atmospheric conditions and it could have been something that was imprinted um, into the atmosphere. Now, sometimes over several years, sometimes the images or the, scent or the noises you know, will pass, other times the images will pass and maybe just the noise will remain, the sound, but eventually it's like a battery running out um, and it will over time disappear. Um, animals such as horses and dogs are said to have psychic sensing. And sometimes these animals, if they're out in these areas, um, they can still pick up something, a, something that happened, a scene of a one-time haunting, as well as humans that may have had uh, psychic abilities. So another example of this would be um, Mrs. Ferguson, who uh, haunted Ferguson's castle in Huntington. Now it's, it's terrible because uh, Ferguson's castle was demolished in 1970. And um, Mrs. Ferguson was a very eccentric woman. She had used children's tombstones from Europe and put them over each of the bedrooms of her house. So if someone stayed, she would say, oh, you can take Abigail's room and it would have a tombstone Oh, of these children, can you imagine? And it was this beautiful, uh, beautiful home that was uh, overlooking Huntington Harbor. But when she died, um, she died of a broken heart from her her son that had passed. And the, the whole story, we could do another webinar just on, on Ferguson's castle. I wish that I could have seen it, but again, it was demolished in 1970. But for years after that, people who drove down the street, even after it had been demolished, had seen the vision of Mrs. Ferguson walking the grounds of where her house used to be. So that is an example of an imprint yeah, I'd like situation. To, I'd like we've to had a few, in. right, Joe? We've had a few. Uh, I'd like to chime in here on something. Um, I don't know if it's Scotland or, or Ireland, but there's an old castle and there, I remember years ago seeing um, a picture of this, this, you know, monk or someone that was standing, you know, mm -hmm. hovering over. It was like an imprint, perfect imprint. The thing was that the foundation had crumbled so that the, the ghost was still in the same spot because they don't move. They're just right. imprinted into the atmosphere. 
So there was nothing that was like three feet under this spirits, this ghostly apparition's feet, mm. because there was there used to be a foundation. Oh, really? Uh, so wow. I have to find that picture, but I do have a picture. Uh, just to remind our audience, this was another um, type of uh, imprint. Um, you remember this, Carrie Ann? This is the uh, Quaker Cemetery. Yes, we the showed Civil this War. recently. Right, and there's, again, that's just the energy is in manifested itself in the um, cemetery. Can you use place. your arrow since it's your screen, Joe, to show sure. where the where he yeah, is? Yeah, so here's the beard, the white beard, his cap, his gun belt, his hat held at his side. You could see, even see the flesh color of his face. Here's his waistcoat, his pants right here. And this tree, the locket of trees that kind of formed. So he's not actually there. It's just sort of an imprint of energy that was able to utilize the um, the shapes of the, the grounds and the trees and the leaves to form this kind of Civil War soldier man that was just just in reverence here at the mm -hmm. cemetery. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to show that's a, yeah, that's a good one. Print. That's a good one. Um, and, the, and the next uh, type of ghost is, is kind of similar to the atmospheric mm -hmm. ghost. This is a cyclic or recurring ghost. And oftentimes these are ghosts who were humans who suffered a traumatic occurrence while on the earth, they can appear in regular cycles, usually annually to when an event took place. There are many reports of uh, cyclic ghosts, but most are not well authenticated. The presence of certain people being there, um, as well as climate conditions, atmospheric pressure and alterations in the magnetic field may all take part and you know, all play a part in such a periodic manifestation. But during my research, and this is something that, that Joe and I have researched, but my own research on this type of ghost, uh, the best example I could give is um, the uh, funeral train of President Abraham Lincoln. Every year it is seen um, in, the, in the West uh, going down, you know, through the fields on the tracks the way it did when it had the body of Abraham Lincoln in it. And thousands of people have reported seeing this annually, this ghost train. So again, is it a haunted train? No, but it is an imprint that for reasons unknown, it has created this phenomenon in the atmosphere and it happens at the same time. I can't believe you found this picture, Joe. This is this is great. Yeah, it was. it's in the public domain. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was a little difficult to find it, but it's a nice picture. Uh, yeah. Can you imagine Abraham Lincoln? They had a photograph of him on the cow catcher on the front of the. the right. Uh, yeah, I see that. Engineer. And they took him across Where? the whole country. I mean, no wonder he's whole... still his train still haunts. He, yeah. Well, like Abraham right Lincoln, there. I would love to do something ah, just on him one definitely. time. Definitely, that mean, would be great. There's a lot of stuff with him, but we do have an example we, we can't discuss. We actually have one of our people in our audience tonight um, who has a house we went to over the summer. And it's in the new book, it's a private home, and they actually have um, an imprint that happens in their backyard every year of people that they think are part of a wedding party. That's the only hint I'm going to mm -hmm. give, but you'll read about that in the new book. But just even this past year, our investigative work um, showed us that this list, again, is still something that is in, a, in existence, because when we interviewed the people, they told us about um, every April seeing this family and um, well, they almost look like they were going to a wedding. So, you know, it, 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 it exists, you know, and this is, this is modern times. Yes. And, um, you know, now we move on to the fourth type, which is, I find very interesting. And I actually happen to have a, an example for you, Carrie. Ann. Okay, good. You've seen it before, I think, but yes. it's been a while. So um, I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Um, and you could talk, when I show you the photo, you could talk a little bit about the place, but uh, family ghosts. Uh, the appearance of a formerly, former fa family member or ghost that attaches itself to a family for one reason or another, uh, sometimes in this case, its function is to warn the family of impending disaster or family death. Uh, in some cases, the manifestation is non-human. In other cases, uh, the former member of the family can make himself or herself known through manipulation of physical objects, for example, um, rather than showing themselves. Um, examples would be a picture falling off the wall, a candle, oh, this is really funny. Uh, yeah, a candle relighting or radios that turn on or off or mechanical 
a mechanical dog in the garage that starts by itself, right, Carrie Ann? <laughs> yeah. So um, of course I'm leading into um, an example. This is the house on Strawberry Lane, which we, how, when did we investigate that? That was, that was how, in the first Ghost of Long Island book. That was yeah. the Wanzer family, that was, right? Right, that was a private home. And they happened to live across from your sister at the time, right? That's or right. Your, where your sister used to live. That's right. And I actually, so you had uh, more experiences there than I did. That was one of our early assignments together. I think it was yeah, there's like the house. Two. Okay. Yeah, can, you, can you see yeah. the house? Yeah. So tell yeah. us a little bit about what you you had experienced yes. before I was even there with you. Well, unfortunately, the picture of the horse that I had the picture of the horse has disappeared. Um, it's completely gone from my file, my archive library. Um, however, I could talk about it. Um, so. Carrie Ann and I went there and we interviewed the family and there were a lot of phenomena. We had our own experiences as well, including uh, when we went into the garage, I think it was a mechanical dog that just started barking. Um, we, had some, we had some feelings of different cold spots, hot spots. And during, we did uh, a thing called a spiritual family reunion because the husband, right? I think it was the father had died. And um, what we did was uh, we got my group into the room. Hang on, let me just put, get back to, you know, here we go. Um, we, we had, uh, went into the room in the living room and uh, this area, this house used to be part of a larger area, which was a strawberry field. And they also had animals. They had horses and everything. They had a barn. And um, what happened was during this seance that we were doing, uh, and it was a crazy night. It was raining and the winds were howling as this perfect night for a haunted house. Um, I felt a large animal enter the living room and the floor sunk. You could hear the floor creak as it went down. A horse, spirit of a horse had entered the room. Now that was a sign from also from the family who had passed, the generations who had passed in the house. And then we got a picture, actually had gotten a picture of a horse, horse's head down one of the corridors just an imprint of it. But um, anyway, uh, I wanna show you something interesting here. Um, so it was, this house really manifested a lot of phenomena for both the family and for us. Carrie Ann, did you get some orbs in the house? I'm trying to remember. I can't remember, cause that was so long ago. I think you mainly had gotten the uh, right. phenomenon at that point. I was a well, newbie then. <laughs> well, here we go. You are about to see a couple of examples of family ghosts who made their appearance. First of all, I just want to point out, notice that um, notice that it's winter and there's snow on the ground. Now, here's the first picture. This is the, was it the great, great grandmother, Della Rie Wanzer? Mm -hmm. And there is a picture of her on the right here, very old picture. And in the doorway here, you see this this apparition? See this figure? That's very similar. Right? I mean, she has this thing here, here, like a crown. Right. The white outfit. Um, sort of even the body's turned the same direction. Mm -hmm. um, so that I feel there was no one in the kitchen at the time. And uh, I feel like that was her energy manifesting. And she would be in the kitchen because right. I think she was a great cook. You know, she mm -hmm. really was cooked uh, meals for the whole family. So it was a real endearing picture. The next one is Ellison Wanzer. And here he is, it's a picture. This is not him standing here. This is actually a, <laughs> right. a photo I photoshopped on top here. Um, I want to point some things out. Notice he's, he's in the uh, Navy, I guess. So the Merchant Marines, he's wearing a Navy outfit, Naval outfit. Notice his, he has a cap that's worn sideways like this. Now look at this window here. Yeah, I saw that right away. Right it's here like he is. He's peering he's, over. He, he's peering over. You could see his same hat. Yeah, same hat, same same hairline, uh, hat line, and he's wearing a white shirt, like a Sunday shirt, mm -hmm. and a tie, and you could see the the flesh of his face, which I think is cool that they painted, and he's leaning in, and he's also yeah. holding what looks like an antenna, an aerial, like an old TV aerial, mm -hmm. which to me. Um, is sort of like the communication symbol. But one other thing I want to point out, notice the background. It's a field of grass, springtime, no snow. Oh, this yeah, is a whatever. reflection. This is a reflection. Right. There should be snow here, but there's not. It's, it's summertime. So 
So I think that's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, that is. You never showed that to me before. Very no? interesting. Oh, yeah, that one's cool. So, and yeah, he's really clear in that, yeah. especially the cap gives it right. away. So um, that's that's crazy. That's good. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So um, yeah, unfortunately, with Carrie and I, you know, when we started <laughs> the book, I was not very good at finding things. And, you know, we didn't know what to look for. That's why right, the Peter Underwood's 10 Ghosts helped. <laughs> later on to get more organized but in the beginning i would like after the book came out i'd say yeah, yeah he showed me you had a picture another picture from there you're like yeah, oh i didn't have like we could have put that in the we book we could have put it in the book right yeah. all right now i want to talk about one of my favorites uh poltergeists uh this type of ghost is the most unpleasant of all and i can speak from personal experience with that all type ghosts that's how i got into this whole business uh, some researchers believe these ghosts are malevolent ent entities who take pleasure in persecuting and frightening innocent people. Maybe. Others believe these disturbances are caused by the type of ghost, sound, movement of object, fire, or water appearing out of nowhere. It may be elementals, which are underdeveloped or imperfect spirits who like to play tricks and jokes, such as moving things around, throwing things, overturning objects, uh, things like that. Um, and spilling items to like knocking over a beer glass or something. Uh, still others believe these ghosts perform phenomena out of exasperation or desperation to communicate with humans. A theory is that poltergeist activity can center around one person in a household um, and usually an adolescent and more commonly uh, a girl because she has high energy levels she has during puberty. So uh, you have all the emotions, the hormones raging, everything. They, the, the kids, they can throw this energy out and it can become uh, like telekinesis. It can turn into something. I actually knew someone, a friend of mine, sister mm -hmm. had this issue. There was, the, the house never had any activity. And then all of a sudden when the girl hit puberty, mm -hmm. there was all these things happening yeah. in the house, phenomenon, things like a, a cat, um, you know, those cat stands, I forget what they're called, the trees or whatever. Cat trees, cats, yeah. Yeah, that was thrown in the middle of the night down the hallway. And once she passed that, uh, that energy shift, everything went back to normal in the house. So it's yeah, unusual. And, yeah, and if you need, if everyone, you guys need like an analogy, think of the movie Carrie, where at the end she gets really angry at everybody and she starts hurling all this stuff and cars are being overturned, the fire, things are blowing up. That It's that kind of a thing, but on a much lesser scale. Now, um, what happens, this period, this period of uh, poltergeist activity can last for a, sh a few days, weeks, months. Um, you know, it could stop as quickly as it begins. Now, uh, Carrie, and you want to talk about... Um, yeah, well, I just told you about my, my friend, uh, my friend's sister. But yeah. we had an example of this because they're not, poltergeist activity is not as common as what Hollywood and TV makes it out no. to be. It's we really have not encountered it at all during our what we've done for the book. Joe has encountered it on his own um, when he first started getting into this. And I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that after. Yeah. Okay. And so then I'll also have Joe. The only house that we did, uh, but we weren't in that house. It was we were, we were talking about a house that had poltergeist. We did visit it though. We yeah. tried to well, get it. We, we, right. We saw the outside. So I'll let you explain <laughs> your experience plus that one. That was an early one from Ghosts of Long Island. Yeah. Okay. So you want me to talk about mine? Well, I just yeah. want to say that what got me into this business in 1980, I moved into a haunted boarding house. Now I'm going to show you a picture. I don't know if this is the house. This is up in a town called Keysville, New York. It's up near Plattsburgh, up near the Canadian border. So again, I don't know if this is the house. I've been searching for this house. Maybe it's not even there. But this looks like the house. Um, let me see if I can find it. Let's see here. There. So I moved into this house. It was a rental. There were like three apartments. The house, or maybe four apartments. They were split two apartments on the left, two on the right. And I, I would be up in this apartment right up here, okay, if this was the house. And you can't see it in this picture, but you know how the Amityville Horror, what they call those eyebrow windows or something? You know, the, you know that window? That's right, like the dormer window. windows, yeah. yeah. Like I, don't think that one, I don't think that one had eyebrow window. I think it was a dormer window. A dormer. Well, this one has that window mm -hmm. and you can't see it's on this side. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I took this apartment up here and immediately, every time I, the, I was sleeping in the dormer, my bed was up here and I started having 
this spirit that this malevolent spirit that was basically suffocating me every night. And the last night I was there, um, I had a manifestation, something like you'd see in the movie Amityville Horror, where things manifested out of nowhere. I, I won't go into details, but it was pretty crazy. How long were you at that place, Joe? Two weeks. <laughs> was it. Two weeks. And the last day I was there, the landlord came with a vacuum cleaner. Again, I'm not going to go into what happened, but he came in and he says, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And he said, do you want your rent back? I said, yes. Now, who gives rent the rent back in New York State? Right, okay. Right. So that house was, it, I think someone had been murdered in that, in that upper uh, room. Mm -hmm. And I think I was immersed in that energy. So, and there was no one there. There were no young people there. Although everybody that, when I first got there and I started unpacking, there were people like lounging around here in the front. And they all seemed like they were stoned, like they were out of it, like they were possessed or something. The house had very weird energy. Again, apologies to whoever owns this house if this is the wrong one, but one day I'm going to find that address. Right. Anyway, so you want to talk a little bit about Skip's? Uh, yeah, actually, because uh, this house that we are talking about that we started for our investigation for yep. the first ghost book, we were interviewing a couple who had poltergeist activity at a previous house they had lived in. And um, that leads into another um topic that we're going to discuss another 10 type of ghosts of the ghosts of inanimate objects so sometimes those can go hand in hand so but we did uh encounter poltergeist activity through these people but we were not witnesses to it this was secondhand information from them so i like to tell you a little bit about modern ghosts now these are the ghosts of recent people who are, have recently died People are more likely to see this type of ghost, believe it or not, than any other um, type of person or ghost, I should say, because it's the recently dead. Um, and most people will not even realize it's a ghost until it has disappeared. There's a lot of evidence that shows that people have seen these type of modern ghosts in familiar surroundings. Um, an example of this, something that we were talking about, Joe, what piqued his interest in the paranormal. Um, the very first ghost story, true ghost story that I had ever heard was when I was growing up about a, um, an attic apartment that my parents had rented. It was actually um, my father's, uh, it was my aunt and uncle's, it was my aunt's parents' house, okay? So they had um, rented this, my aunt and uncle were not married yet, so they weren't living in the attic apartment. My parents lived there first. And then when my parents moved out and my aunt and uncle got married, this was, you know, the home that she grew up in. She and her husband, my uncle, moved in and they had, um, my cousin was born there. And it appears as the last story of my uh, Ghosts of Long Island two more stories, stories of the paranormal. And it's called The Ghost of the Italian Grandfather. And my mother um, had had an accident and she was recovering and she was in um, the bedroom of this attic apartment. And she saw this man, uh, this Italian looking man wearing a white undershirt and suspenders and trousers. And she actually thought that she was dying Okay. And uh, when she realized that she wasn't, and she got out of bed and she went, they, she and my father were very close to the, uh, the people who had owned the house, my aunt's parents. And when she described the person to, um, you know, my aunt's mother, she went white as a ghost herself, because the description was so accurate. And she says, I've seen him too it was the, the father, okay, um, that had passed away. So many people, the next door neighbors saw him walking and actually knocked on the door and say, you might want to check on your father because it's freezing out. And he's been walking around outside with an undershirt on, but it wasn't him. He had been, she had to tell him he had passed. Mm -hmm. that it must be seeing something. So that is an example of modern ghosts. And then my aunt and uncle, uh, they had eventually seen him too. But over time, you know, this disappeared, this type of thing. But that's an example of modern ghosts. And I did write about that in Ghosts of Long Island too. 
Yeah, that's good um, a crisis apparition is similar, but um, they are also ghosts of the recently dead, but they appear for a limited time, usually uh, no more than four days. It's often the spirit of a loved one who's coming to say goodbye, who couldn't because of how they had passed. There were thousands of examples of crisis apparition ghosts um, appearing to people during both world wars. Um, it is the most common and spontaneous manifestation. So an example that I give, uh, I don't know if Joe and I have really encountered this particular ghost in uh, what we do, but an example would be, um, and I'm sure you've heard of things like this, there's a mother or a grandmother uh, who has a loved one overseas, a husband, a son, and all of a sudden in the middle of the night, they wake up and they see the image of this son or this husband and it's a visitation and they're confused because they know that they're you know overseas but then the next morning they get a knock on the door or a phone call or a letter stating that that person had passed so in those cases in and trauma where people haven't had the time to say goodbye properly Oftentimes they will appear to their loved ones for a short period of time before they cross in order to say goodbye to them. So that's I have, a crisis. I, I, have a, I have a story, a personal story of that. My dad, when my dad was, uh, he had injury in World War II. And when he was in New York, he came back injured. Uh, he was uh, in the hospital having some back surgery or neck surgery or something. So he was laid out. And while he was in bed, his dad, my grandpa uh, died and nobody wanted to tell my father, uh, Joe was also Joe. And um, he was in his room and suddenly the room was filled with light and he saw his father. Did he realize? And, yes, he saw it standing at the foot of the bed. This is the exact quote dad used to tell me. Standing at the head of the bed, you know, the foot of the bed, I guess, um, bathed in light with all these windows behind him and he was wearing his Hamburg hat. That's what dad used to say. I guess mm -hmm. my grandfather had a Hamburg hat, whatever that is, whatever that looks like. And he was an Italian man. And, um, and then he disappeared. Wow. And um, all of a sudden the brothers came in with the funeral suits and uh, they said, Joe, you know, uh, we have some bad news for you. He says, I know, Pop died. He says, who told you, the doctors? He said, no, he came and visited me on the way out. Wow, you never told me that. No, I, I had forgotten. Yeah. I didn't well, that's a connection. perfect example of that. That's, yeah. that's a crisis apparition ghost, for sure. Thank you for Amazing. letting me share thank, that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, another interesting one is uh, ghosts of the living. Now, this is perhaps the most unusual of all the types of ghosts. And it's certain people under certain conditions which are not yet established have been seen in multiple places at the same time. This is also known as bilocation. Although Joe and I have not encountered this in the work we have done, I have encountered it in my book that I wrote called The Metal about Padre Pio. Padre Pio was a saint who bore the stigmata and he also uh, had many gifts, the gift of performing miracles, the gift of prophecy, uh, the gift of reading hearts and the gift of bilocation. And it is very, very well documented that Padre Pio at times, especially during the war, would appear in Germany and Italy simultaneously. So um, that would be ghosts of, it was just called ghosts of the living. Obviously he was someone that was still alive, but they put uh, the ability of, to do bilocation into that category of ghosts of the living. Ariana, um, I, I have a question. Where would you put, like, we've talked, I think, once before about, like, the Lady of Fatima, mm -hmm. you know, like, where people go to the pilgrimage, they've seen the Virgin Mary. Yeah, you know, that's what interesting. Kind, what kind of ghost, where would we put that in the list of 10? Would that be mm -hmm. some, a different? Um, I mean, it could be, well. It's not an imprint, because she's alive. Well, she, I mean, they yeah, would be, just, right. It's not atmospheric because that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I wonder. I have I to think about that. I know. Maybe that we could ask that's... Adam. Yeah. Ask him Adam, where, where, where it fits. That is, that is interesting because there are so many sightings of uh, the saints. But again, like yes. when the Padre Pio, though, he was still alive when this was going right. on. That's right. Um, but with these other apparitions that have appeared, they the people have passed on and they were already, you know, saints or anything like that. 
So yeah. we basically now have two more categories yes, yes. of the ten types of ghosts. So, yes. so this is Joe's expertise here. Now, first, I just want to give you a, this. <laughs> I just want to give you a teaser. I have assembled a little video thing of some of my haunted collection, but oh, you we're, not gonna, we're not going to show because we're going to do a separate show on that, right? Probably. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Okay. But um, Carrie and did did wrestle up. I did dig here. one picture from the first ghost book. Yeah, let's see if we can find that there. And oh, <laughs> that's, that's a haunted not, cat. <laughs> a haunted cat. Hang on a second. I think I got the wrong slide. Um, I know it's here somewhere. There it is. Okay, we got it. This now my, this is a classic photo. <laughs> I forgot about this photo. <laughs> There's I could name Joe. the scary, the scary thing is yeah. I can name all those dolls. Um, yeah, the, 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 these two were my faves. This is where right. my spirit guide, Melissa came from, um, was channeling, I think this doll or this doll, I'm not sure. Maybe well, why don't you explain first of all, what the category yeah. is? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, sure, sure. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, this has been overwhelming evidence for ghostly inanimate objects like clocks, chairs, dolls, cars, airplanes, trains, um, rocking chairs, jewelry, boxes, music boxes, they can be, what happens is you have, um, somebody puts energy into something. For example, let's say you're, you're a young girl and you have a doll and you grow up with a doll. Uh, for example, one of my nieces, many years ago, I got her um, Big Bird from Sesame Street, you know, stuffed doll. She still got that thing. I mean, it's like, just completely destroyed. There's no more feather packing <laughs> it, but she still has it. So all those years, this girl puts this energy into this doll and it's like charging up a battery. And what happens is the battery discharges under the right triggered circumstances. So with these inanimate objects, you know, they say, I saw the doll's eyes move. Well, they don't really, the eyes don't really move. What happens is the spirit that is attached to that object can put energy on the object so that it looks like it's animated. All right. So this is a collection of my dolls. Uh, and I think I brought one the first time I met you, right? I brought one. Yeah, to well, you have to explain too. Joe doesn't have all these dolls for himself. You have That's since right. gotten rid of most of them. He I, had, well, they're all at gone. the time that I met him, he yeah, was he was studying this. I was, to clarify. Yes, um, yes, he was, was studying this. That's why he had to talk. Kind of a weird. It's kind <laughs> yeah, of yeah, weird, Joe, it's really you know, not, luck, Yeah, it's lucky for you. I even started working with you. I thought you I were the you, axe murderer you, back in the day. You, and you remember how the people Whoopi descended? Dolls. When, yeah, the, the the people in the conclave, there were like 50 people and they all descended. Yeah, and you had the one to touch the doll. Right, one doll. So. I studied the dolls because they're interesting. The way I got into the haunted doll things actually is my brother-in-law. We were surfing eBay one night and it was something, somebody was selling this haunted doll, Vera. Let's see if it's here, Vera's here. Uh, I don't know if she's in this group. Anyway, oh, here she is right here, the puppet doll. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and he said, oh, look, you should bid on this. And I said, all right, I'll bid 50 bucks. I'll never win it, you know, because the bidding was going up. Well, nobody else bid and I bought it. And, you know, on eBay, when you buy it, you got to pay for it. You got to get it. It was delivered in a coffin box, which was like a little old wooden <laughs> bait box, like a tackle box, but it was, it looked like a coffin. This was the only doll that I had that I actually felt was alive. Now, it didn't mean it moved around. It was porcelain, so you'd have to heat it up to 500 degrees or something. But it actually had a lot of energy to it. And that was that was a kind of a cool doll. Um, and then we had the mascot, remember? Um, yeah, that was during Mike, uh, the Michael story. Michael was, story so where he had that. It was a monkey. It was a monkey. And that symbols. thing used to start up by itself, yeah. Yeah, that so, was told to us by his parents. Said that's that there right. was phenomenon around that. And then also so, when we were in Strong's Neck, uh, we had encountered um, at one of the Strong's houses mm -hmm. a clock that they said that That's there right. was unexplained things. So again, so I want to reiterate, gotta, it's not like what you see the Chucky dolls and things coming alive and murder you. It's really more of a transference of energy. That's right. It's a type of phenomenon. It's not that the doll or the clock or the, the monkey I, I, with the symbols is haunted, but it has 
created this energy that was residual energy from its past owners. Yeah, but I'm going to tell you what we are definitely going to do a thing on the haunted dolls, inanimate mm -hmm. objects, because I have two really it's very cool misunderstood. Yeah. It's it's really cool, but it you know yeah you have to be scientific about this stuff. You can't let this keep you up at night because it's it's really just about energy transference, as Carrie Ann said. It's really just it's another way that the spirit world. Um, and psychic energy gets imparted. Remember we did the table tipping mm -hmm. at yes. the workshop with Bill Collar. Right. And so that you put in, you put psychic energy into anything, a table, and it will start jumping around. So that's what inanimate objects are. And we're gonna have a special thing on that. I think mm -hmm. it's a, there's a lot to that. We got some great stuff to show you. Right. The last one I'd like to talk about is animal ghosts. Uh, a very no another common type of ghost, uh, loyal pets have been known to come back to their owners to comfort them in some cases save their lives. They usually come back to the place in which they live. Now, um, Carrie, you wanna talk about the dog at the Villa Paul and then I wanna show a couple of pictures. Yeah, um, Villa Paul was in um, haunted, uh, historic haunts of Long Island. It's out, it's a restaurant in Hampton Bays. And we were interviewing um, the owners at the time, the restaurant was closed. And as soon as we sat down, within 10 minutes of starting our investigation, Joe said that a dog had just come, or actually at the time you thought it was a cat because you thought it was small. It was small. And, yeah. uh, and they, they looked shocked and they said to Joe, it's not a cat, it's a dog, it's a small dog. So they knew right away because many people had experienced this ghostly dog coming through. One of the waitresses had actually seen the dog and dropped an entire tray of food. Um, so Joe, within 10 minutes of being there, had uh, picked up on that. And then there was another story that was told to us about the Gray Horse Tavern, which was in Bayport. The house is still there, but unfortunately, the restaurant um, Shame, is right. no longer there. But they, many people claim to have seen um, a horse because wasn't there the story of a, they, they would bring the horse in and have them have a drink at the bar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was and one customer there have used been, to bring a horse in. Yeah, I wish we had gotten you know a photograph of that, but we weren't lucky to capture an apparition of a horse there. But there's an imprint of an animal ghost there. And animals um, do cross over to the other side. I'm a huge animal lover, so they do go to, my belief is heaven, and they are there to greet us when we pass. And they do come back to check on us, just like our own family members. And I've had many people report to me that they'll be sleeping at night and they'll no longer have an animal, but they'll feel the way a dog or a cat will do that circle thing before they lay down. And so it should be very comforting to know that um, ghosts, I've had it in my own house, I've had many animals. And when I've gotten a, a dog after my previous dog passed away, I have noticed things with the new dog um, that has led me to believe that they have seen the ghost of some of my past animals. So it's very, very interesting. Um, and that's why you can't just say like Hollywood just wants to put it all right, a ghost is a lady in white with blood dripping down her face, and she's out to kill everybody. That's yeah, not I, what a ghost is. So we spend our lectures and our lifetime work, you know, talking about these 10 different types of ghosts and the difference between ghosts and spirits, which we've, which, as you know, we did a past webinar, because it's important to make that clarification. So yeah, um, and I know, have Peter um, Underwood had, I mean, it's perfect, this list, it just, it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a couple of pictures of animal okay. ghosts. Okay. Oh, I you know I remember waking up once, um, and uh, my cat was alive at the time. But I remember waking up and seeing a little gray cat on the edge of my bed, just an apparition, and it disappeared. It was probably mm -hmm. one of my cat's friends. And here now we get to see the picture of my cat, and this was uh, okay. So that's Callie. She lived almost twenty four. She's uh, well fed in this picture. Mm. And, um, but what I want to point out to everybody is look over here at the armchair. You see the orange tabby cat? Oh yeah, you can almost see it, yeah. Yeah, now there's no way it's a reflection of Cali. Right. It's not the same color. And also it's reflecting from where I would be standing. Mm -hmm. So there's no way it could be her because you wouldn't see her face. So here's the face, the eye, oh, wow. the, yeah. orange, the ears. So that's a little cat that was hanging out. Here's another one. Let's see here. Now this is Callie was on the um, windowsill sleeping and look at the little cat 
right here. Mm -hmm. See the eyes, the mm -hmm. ears, little cat friend right here, just materialized next to Callie. She's a very spiritual cat. Mm -hmm. The last one I have, I showed this to you guys before. Oh, right, right. Teddy who passed and Teddy had a little cat friend that was right here. And um, so that's no, just that's some nice. She has some nice little pictures there that to is. cap off the animal ghost. But uh, yeah, so, so anyway. That's that's the 10 types of ghosts. So before we get to questions, um, I just have a couple of announcements. We do have our next webinar will be coming up on Wednesday, uh, February 24th, where we will do an in-depth study of Execution Rocks Lighthouse. There's um, a lot to that, that history. We've shown you pictures from there before. I was going through my archives and I have some uh, photos of never before seen pictures. I think you do as well, Joe. So we will delve into the history of that a little bit more. I had my list. I, I did write everything down that you all wanted me to write down last time. So we will be continuing in March and April with some webinars, but I forget what they are now. <laughs> I have it written down, but I don't have my list in yeah, front of me. We have, um, well, inanimate objects. Um, we have, what well, we that have? one we don't have scheduled yet. yet. Um, okay. Yeah. So let's get to some of the questions here now. Okay. Um, all right, Jean wants to know what kind of ghosts touch you or are trying to communicate? What kind of ghosts touch you or are trying to communicate? Do you wanna take that one, Joe? Yeah, well, um, again, ghosts, there's a difference between ghosts and spirits. So spirits would be sentient beings, uh, loved ones who've passed. Um, so the, the the gift of mediumship or the uh, type of mediumship called clear sentience, which means feeling, uh, can include touching. So usually it's a spirit of someone, a loved one that wants to reach out to you and, and uses some sort of ability to touch you. Uh, in Carrie Ann's uh, situation, in William Sidney Mount, uh, the famous William Sidney Mount artists. Um, mm. He uh, hangs out with Carrie and she can feel when he's sitting in the car next to her. Uh, but anyway, um, so a ghost really doesn't do that. A ghost is more of place centered. So the ghost you might find in a particular room um, where a spirit would move around, would follow you around, it would be someone that's connected to your space, your, your life. Um, so what do you think, Carrie? And is, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, they, they can, if they're good communicators, um, there's another story in the new book that we can't mention right now. It's the last chapter of the book. I wish we um, could talk about these. I things, know, you know I know. But, uh, you know, like we talked about Annette, the ghost at the country house, sometimes it's a little bit of semantics. Uh, Annette, I consider her to be a ghost, but she's also a spirit. So mm -hmm. she is, she might be grounded to that place she she's centered but there, she communicates but yeah. she communicates so yeah. there is energy from her spirit that uses her ghostly appearances her energy to flash the light in the room to let everybody know she's there things like that right and she did that at your house too okay now someone reported i must have missed this but this has happened many times on the webinars for reasons unknown someone said that there flash. was a huge light flash on me yeah. again it's the weirdest thing. I mean, nothing's going on. I have my light next to me and nothing. No, is it's flashing. definitely spiritual. This happened yeah. to Carrie Ann when we did film uh, The Ghost of Long Island uh, and um, was the one from the country house. We were talking about Annette, the spirit, the ghost. And um, we went to Carrie Ann's house to do the wrap up. And the, we had the cameraman there. And when we started talking about how Annette communicates, her room flashed like you saw it, like you see on the webinar sometimes. So maybe it's a net. Mm -hmm. Could be a net that's hanging out. Could with be. Well, in my office, aspect. this I'm in my office, my my third floor office. So yeah. this is a very oh, you spiritual have, you've place. Got everybody. So. You've got William <laughs> Sidney now. I have everybody here. up here. So the who knows who it could be. Um, so Jean continued her question. What, uh, let's see. Um, periodically I get touched or they call my name. I don't know who they are. I startle before I can grasp their message. What should I do? Mm -hmm. um, it could be family members, Jean, you know, just wanting to communicate with you. Yeah. Um, so what do you have to offer there, Joe, as far as like, well, I mean, there's um, not a whole lot you can do. You could talk to them and say, I know that you're here. I'm not sure who yeah, you I are. Yeah, I could give you a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, 
the good the the possibility is it may be to be some random person that just wants to touch you, some spirit that's on the other side. That yeah, Jean wandered. just said she feels like she doesn't know who they are. Right. Okay. So well, maybe I'm getting, it came um, with the house. I'm getting cold spots around me, Carrie, and right now my temperature in, around me is dropping. So um, okay, so maybe it's that spirit. Um, yeah. So what you have to do is this: we once investigated a house in Huntington Bay, a, pr a private home where the three-year-old girl, uh, her name was Lola, uh, she had this, this spirit of this boy that was showing up to her every night. And she would go to bed, she was crying all the time, screaming, she was scared. So we went over the house and we, we basically sat down in the dining room and we had a conversation with the spirit. We said, look, touching's not appropriate. Waking this girl up at three in the morning is not appropriate. You wanna stay here, fine. You lived in this house years ago, fine but you have to respect that we need our sleep. We don't want to be bothered and you shouldn't be touching us inappropriately. I got a letter from the girl's mother two weeks later saying the, her girl, her daughter came to her and said, mommy, where'd the ghosts go? Yeah, because so you can, you can talk to them. You can talk We've to them. given yeah. this advice and it sounds crazy because you feel like you're talking to no one. Yeah, and don't but, worry about it. Remember, yeah. they are invisible. They are a spirit. So it is creepy because if you are feeling something, they are reaching out to you. you. Just have to set boundaries. Just say, right. just tell them what you want or don't want. And if it is a family member, just say, try to get some kind of communication established with them. Ask them, um, you know, to give you a sign or something of what they want to tell you. That's a, that's a, that's a good answer, uh, Joe. From Maria, um, uh, oh, and Jean said too, I've sat with a lot of people who've died. So, you know, it could be some of those people coming back to thank yeah, I, you. I just want to say, Jean, you know, you could have befriended someone at the bus stop, some guy that was lonely, a woman that maybe had a tough life and you're sitting at the bus stop or an airline waiting to board the plane. And you said, oh, I hope you have a nice day. And that person died. And they just remembered you were a nice person. So. And I think quick... she, Jean has been, cause she's, she's emailed me. She's been with people from. Yeah, I just want to tell you a really funny in. quick story about this. Just so you don't don't get too worried about this kind of stuff, because my uh, we have some friends who they spent some time out west and renting like a timeshare or something, and they went to bed, and in the middle of the night, the wife felt somebody this bed sink down, and she thought it was her husband getting into bed with her. You know, maybe they were in twin beds, or two beds, but then maybe she well, he's going to sleep, he's going to come over and nuzzle up to me. Well, she turns on the light and her husband's in the other bed on the other side of the room sleeping. So evidently somebody just decided to, to get in bed with. <laughs> oh, remember, this is, that's an unusual set of circumstances. Yeah, so it could be, so I would say anything can happen. So right. don't worry too much about it. It doesn't yeah. sound okay. malevolent at all. Um, for Maria, this question I've gotten many times over the years. Maria has asked, will ghosts follow people they love to a different house if they move? Well, here's the thing. It, again, it depends on the type of ghost. Right. So most of the time, um, people who get used to the ghosts in their house, they have asked me like, oh, well, you know, I've gotten used to the ghosts and I'm moving to North Carolina. Is the ghost going to come? If it's a, a historical figure ghost, um, it's place centered. So it will not, it will stay with the property. I've never really heard of situations where ghosts that are not family members that have died that have gone on like okay yeah, i'll move I, actually to i have i, I haven't I, i've never come across that i have Everyone to chime has in had a, a ghost they've left the ghost behind yeah, but you've had something different joe it's the same story huntington bay during the the seance that we did it became a, i started the spirit or ghost started telling me you know of this boy said um I've been, I've been here before. And I said to the father, I said, have you had this same haunting where this, your daughter was seeing this ghost when you lived in the city? And he says, Joe, I have to admit, yes. Really? The same, yeah. That's what very happened, unusual. It is. I've and never father, encountered that. I know. What happened was the father was very interested in this occult stuff. And so he was creating a portal to 
with Ouija board, whatever. It oh, was well, that's causing a little different things. Thing. Yeah. yeah. So the spirit was following them from one okay, place to yeah. another. Yeah. But in a regular house where people have activity. No, it stays. It stays. It stays. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see what Good else questions. we have. Um, uh, all right. Peter wrote a ton of books. He did. Um, oh, this is in the photo of the Strawberry Lane house, Joe. Mm -hmm. They want to know, um, is that an orb over the house or the moon? Uh, it, I think that's a lens flare because I the sun so. was on the other yeah. side. So that's it was just, it like it's bad. yeah, when you, when the sun glares off your camera lens, you get these kind of hexagonal images. It's, it has to do with the way it reflects through the lens. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't think it is. I think it's just a reflection from the sun. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. um, and it does look cool. It is interesting though, the way it hovers over the house. Yeah, that is yeah. interesting. Um, Angela brings up what we were talking about before uh, with religious figures. Yes. Um, she says it brings up the question of where is the resurrected bodies of the Virgin Mary and Jesus, and they have appeared to people. Um, it's always fascinated me. I mean, that's a whole other uh, study as far as, um, you know, the religious miracles that have occurred and why, and a lot of them don't have explanations to that. So, um, and can I, I say, I think that that would fit into living family ghosts because, because they really aren't dead. They've risen mm -hmm. from the dead. And they also, you mentioned by location, which would also right. explain why they can be in many people can have these visions in many places. So maybe, maybe that's a category we want to attribute it to. I don't know. Yeah. And then Francis, uh, leads in with her question similar. Um, remember, Frances had told us in one of the past webinars that uh, she told us about seeing Jesus at the foot of her mm -hmm. bed mm -hmm. and that she'd also see angels. Are they ghosts? Angels or angels is totally a separate thing yeah, from, right. from ghosts. And there are a lot of people, um, back when Joe and I did our radio show, we knew people who did angel readings and that type of thing. It's a whole other category of uh, phenomenon. I had someone today just send me um, some photographs that were captured of, of angels that people have gotten. Um, so that's a, a different category. It's not considered one of the 10 types of ghosts because they are their own they're type a different, of spiritual they're a higher being. Level, they're at a higher, higher level. level, exactly. Yeah. Higher level and, of, of and, being. And I just want to say something too, to alleviate any concerns about being touched or someone around you, you don't know who they are. Remember that the spirit world is populated by all the moms and dads who've passed and their moms and dads. So when you think, gee, is some creepy guy hanging around my family from the other side, who you have around you, you have your loved ones who passed, your ancestors, you have Jesus, if you believe, or if you have a different religion, that's fine, whatever, take a grain of salt, whatever I say, religiously. Um, you have the big guy up there or gal, you know, you have your angelic beings, you have your master teachers, you have your spirit guides, spirit guides yeah. and you have a lot of people that you don't know that just watch out for you because the spirit world is all about life, light and love. And there's it's different, not, there's different levels to that. There are many yeah. levels. So that's why this is a lot tonight, of good company. Right. And tonight we were just specifically talking about ghosts. We weren't even talking about spirits per se. No, they not were really, no. literally just, um, you know, on the understanding of what a ghost is and the different types. So I hope that that has helped you to bring you a better understanding of what they are. So if you have your own experiences, you could say, oh, that's right. I think that was that kind of ghost. And now you could say you experienced it. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this evening. Uh, again, thank you. We have a lot of regulars that keep signing up every week. We've enjoyed having you. I just wish we could see you and converse, but I love that you are active uh, with the questions every every time we have these. So it keeps us up and running. Um, you know, again, if you do not get my emails, you can sign up through my website at carrieannflanaganbroski.com and you'll get emails to let you know about future webinars, uh, exactly when the book's coming out, where we're going to be, that type of thing. Um, and, and, our, and hopefully this fall, you know, I know, get I back hope to so. in-person events. You're welcome, and, uh, Fran. <laughs> Fran saying thank you. So thank you all. And I hope you join us um, again for the 24th. It's a Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. You'll be getting an email about that as a reminder for the in-depth study on Execution Rocks Lighthouse. So for now, I want to say good night. Good night, everyone. See you soon. Bye. Bye.